church. Glad to be at church today. God, it's a good day to be alive. Yeah. Woo! <laughs> I'm glad you guys are here. Listen, we're in week two of a series we've called That Was the Style. And uh, today's message title is What Was I Thinking? Come on, you ever been there? You ever look back on something you wore 20 years ago and said, What was I thinking? Some of y'all. Some of y'all got told that this week. What are you thinking? What were you thinking? Uh, hey, listen, b- before we dive into the message today, I do want to remind you, you heard it today. S- small groups kick off today. Uh, you probably have in your worship guide uh, a guide. It gives you all the list of all the different small groups. You can even go online at cultivatechurch.tv. You can go on the church app. You can uh, take a look at all of those uh, different groups. And I want to encourage you, get into a group. If you're not in a small group, If you're not in a small group, I want you to know, listen, you're not even scratching the surface of what God could be doing through your life and in your life through this church. You get pastored to a greater degree in small groups. You gain community, accountability. It's life-giving. It's fun. If you go to a group and it's not fun and it's kind of weird and you're not really sure about all the people, just don't go back, okay? It's okay. Find a new one. There's a lot of them. Uh, There's from Bible study groups to workout groups to all parenting groups, all... It literally covers the spectrum of things that would meet your needs in this season of your life. And you need to be in community, all right? Small groups start when? Today. Let's start today. Go ahead, uh, log online, join a small group, be a part of community this fall here with us at Cultivate Church, all right? Hey, go ahead and pull out your notes. We're going to read our theme verse together. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, and it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. They are a new creation. The new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. Come on, say, the old has what? Gone. The new is here. The new is here. I think Paul spends the vast majority of his writings in the New Testament convincing people, attempting to convince people, hey, the old is gone. The new is here. You don't have to hold on to the old. You don't have to go back to the old. Just because it's familiar, just because you somehow found comfort in it, doesn't mean you have to stay in it. God's new plan, God's new love, God's new grace, it far exceeds any of the old stuff that we found ourselves in in our life. And maybe some of you are here today and you're stuck in the old. Maybe the new hasn't come. Maybe you're just stuck. It's the perpetual uh, day in, day out life that you're living. Here's what we've learned at Cultivate Church, that the vast majority of people are just just existing. They just exist. You go to, you, you, you live your life. You go to the, the job day in, day out. You do your routine day in, day out, only to get up the next day to do it all over again, really never serving a full purpose in your life. And we know that God designed us for something greater. Do you know that if you're breathing today, if you've got breath in your lungs, he has a plan for you that far exceeds your expectations? Did you know that he wants to do more in you and through you than you ever dreamed imaginable? That life that you're living that you can't seem to figure out and what's my purpose and what am I going to do and I wish things were different, it can be different. It can be that way. And today we're going to talk about what that looks like, all right? So uh, all month long, the series is titled That Was the Style. So to illustrate uh, a spiritual makeover, to illustrate the, the power of it, the, uh, the, the transformation that could happen, we've taken some people this month and we've given them some physical makeovers. So I've got a video I want you to check out. Hey guys, we're at 7th Heaven today. Today is makeover day for Stacy Hurt. We're super excited. Let's go in and see what's happening. So it looks like we are beginning the process. If you could just kind of give us a little bit of insight to what you're going to be doing to Stacy's hair today. Okay, so I am actually going in right now and doing a base color and we're going to deepen her and then I'm going to go in and balayage and add some lighter pieces and really frame her face to show her eyes off. Okay, awesome. Woohoo! Okay, so for all the men out there, I'm sure that they're wondering, what is a balayage? <laughs> it's actually just a technique where you just freehand the color in. It actually is an Italian word, and it means just like lightly painting. So we're just going to go and lightly paint some water pieces.
So today we went in and did a shadow root on Stacy, and then we balayaged her ends and added some lighter pieces and then we cut it and layered it and texturized it because she has really thick hair just to help her be able to manage it better. I love it. Yay. We're here with Stacy. She's already gotten her hair done. We're gonna do makeup. We're gonna choose clothes today and just continue giving her some TLC to just freshen up her look and make her feel her best. All right, I am so excited about your new look. What we've done for Stacy is with makeup, we've done just something super natural so that she still feels like her, just a polished version. We got her in this fall outfit that I'm so excited about. How do you feel about it? I feel very confident and I just, like you said, I feel polished. I feel um, like I had a lot of fun and just got to have some time. Oh, give him a big hand, wasn't that awesome? Hey, a big thank you to 7th Heaven. Patty, you guys were awesome, and Porcelain and Pink for making that happen. Listen, uh, here's what I've learned through some of these makeover processes. Uh, Y'all, it's a lot different with a man. <laughs> uh, you know what I get asked when I go to the barbershop? Hey, you want a one or a two? <laughs> Y'all make up words that I've never heard of in my life. It's like y'all performing surgery uh, in there, and it takes a lot longer uh, then, then I took Shepard uh, Friday. We went and got a haircut. Ah, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, and and that was probably with a 15 minute wait time. Uh, y'all gotta y'all gotta set like set aside time. Like, uh, pray for me. I'm going to get my hair done this week. You know, like it's a lot to do. It's a lot of stuff. So here's what I've also learned: that no matter what. No matter what, um, from now on, well, I've learned over the years, I've been married 14 years, if my wife goes and gets her hair done, I don't care what I think it looks like. It looks incredible. It looks incredible because it took 10 days. You know what I'm saying? It took forever. Hey, listen, a, a makeover, when you get your, when you, anybody ever just feel better when you get a haircut, when you get a make, when you get new stuff, you get new clothes, you get a new hair, you color your hair, whatever it looks like, you just feel you feel better. Change feels good sometimes, right? Uh, and, and the reality is that same thing. The Bible says the old has gone, the new is here. Makeovers can be drastic. They really can. And spiritual makeovers should be just as drastic. When God does something in your life and through your heart, when he does something inside of you, it ought to be drastic. It ought to be a change take place. The Bible says that old, the old man, the old stuff, the old inclinations, the old stuff, it's all gone. There is a newness of life that comes. And today we're going to open up God's word and uh, we're going to pray in a moment. And then I'm just going to share with you really what, what we would say is you've probably said this before. Maybe somebody has said, why are you wearing that? And you go, what's wrong with my, what's wrong with what I'm wearing? What's wrong with my style? What's wrong with what I'm doing? We're going to share a little bit about that. And then I'm going to give you some practical steps, I think, to begin to understand newness of life in Jesus. Are you ready for that? Hey, let's, let's pray and let's dive in together. Father, we love you. Man, we're grateful for your word. We're grateful for your favor, your goodness, your grace, your love on our lives. Uh, God, I'm not naive to think that everybody that would walk through these doors at every campus, God, the hundreds of people worshiping at Cultivate today, that we would all be going through the same thing at the, at the same time, dealing with the same issues and intricacies of our lives. Uh, but God, we know that it's, it can be complicated, that we are all walk, coming to, the, to this room together, this auditorium together. We're coming to the table uh, with different things, different scenarios, different walks of life, all different things going on in our lives. So God, we recognize that only through the power of the Holy Spirit could something like this take place today, that we would open your word and you could meet all of us individually right where we are uh, and speak into our lives. So Father, I pray that that begins to happen today. We invite you in, Holy Spirit, to have your way. God, perform spiritual surgery on our hearts. Do what only you can do. And God, you'll get all the credit for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the problem with style, number one, is it's deceitful. It's deceitful. You ever thought something looked good, except it didn't? <laughs> you thought maybe for a season it did, except uh, you realized that it was not, it was deceitful. You were deceived by 
people, you know, there's something about style. It can be the dumbest looking thing on the planet. You get a couple thousand people wearing it, everybody thinks it's awesome. <laughs> like, like it doesn't matter. Like it can be the dumbest looking thing, but all of a sudden it's, it's just, you're deceived by the reality of it. Hebrews 3.13 gives us a warning. And he tells us, listen, this is huge because in our culture, we're not allowed to do this. We're told over and over again in our culture, like you be you and I'll be me. Leave me alone. Don't tell me what to do. It says you must warn each other. Come on, warn each other. When? Every day. Warn each other every day. While it's still today, what's he mean by that? It means that, that uh, there's going to come a time when tomorrow doesn't come. There's going to come a time when this world is no more. And while we still have our life, while we still have breath in our lungs, warn each other every day. Why? So that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. So that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Why does he say for us to warn each other every day? Why? Because it is so much easier to recognize sin for what it is on the outside looking in than the person living in the moment right then. It is easy for me to recognize issues in your life while, while ignoring them in my own life. Come on, aren't you? You ever been there before? You ever been there like you can see your friends making destructive decisions and doing things that you know are going to be bad decisions that you know are going to be like, come on, parents, you ever seen that with your kids? Like, you know that you know that you know there are going to be consequences on that decision outside looking in, but it's easy to ignore the decisions we're making in our own life. That's why scripture calls us to accountability. It's why it calls us to warn one another because I would hope that there are people in my life, if they saw me doing something absolutely stupid that I did not recognize in my own strength that somebody would say, Brandon, stop. Like I would hope that there's people in my life that if they saw me walking out in front of a big bus and I didn't see it coming, they would go drag me back from the bus, warn each other every day. And you want to underline that part so that you will not be deceived by sin and hardened against God. You see, sin's hope is that you'll never understand that it's a counterfeit. Sin's hope is that you'll never recognize it for what it is. It always promises everything it can't deliver. Sin overpromises and underdelivers it every single time. There's never been a time in the history of the world where sin has actually delivered the fullness of what it promised. It's always kind of a half truth. It's always got a little bit of truth mixed in with the devastation that it brings on the back end. There is no sin in this world that has ever delivered on its promise. It's never going because it hardens us towards God. And here's the deceitfulness of it. No one has ever walked into a sin decision. Nobody's ever walked into a bad decision thinking it was a bad decision. Have you? Like nobody's ever walked in going, this is going to be terrible. I'm excited about the devastation that's going to come on the back end of this decision. I can't wait to see all the trouble I'm going to get in when I make this decision. Nobody's ever done that. We all go into decisions thinking they're smart decisions. We all, we all make style decisions. We never, we, we never intentionally wear clothes that we know make us look like a clown. <laughs> like we never intentionally put on something that we know that we know that we know it is not going to work, right? We think in the moment, in the moment we think, Man, I'm looking good. I got it going on. Until, the, until about 25 people look at you funny, and then you're like, mm, maybe I made a mistake. Sometimes we don't even realize that it was a mistake until 20 years later when you pull that picture out and go, oh my God, what was I thinking? You were deceived, right? You were deceived. That's the, that's the trick of sin in our life. It's the trick of sin. It's deceitful. It never wants us to know that that's what it is. So it overpromises results in our lives. Number two, if you're taking notes, you need to know that it's temporary. Come on, style's very temporary too, isn't it? It's crazy now that it's even more so than it used to be. Like it's almost month to month now, uh, the way style changes. And it's crazy. Like it's impossible to keep up 
with what style is in at, at any moment in time because it's temporary. One day this is going on and you go out and you spend $1,000 on the new style only to realize that in three months it's over and now this is worthless and you can't be seen in public with it, right? Because it's not what's in. It's temporary. It's fleeting. Come on, Hebrews 11 gives us some insight to what that looks like in it as it relates to us spiritually. Moses made a decision. It says it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Listen to this. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. Come on, you want to underline that part in your notes if you're taking notes. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. I love that. He was looking ahead to his great reward. The pleasure of any sin is fleeting because it's only designed to be a fake imitation. You see, there was never, there was never a full design given to any sin in this world because it was only designed to be a carrot dangled in front of you. So the engineering to take place to fully follow through on the results of what it's promising was never put in place because it was only designed to get us a certain, uh, it was only designed to get us to the cliff right? It was only designed to get us to that moment and to deceive us. It's very temporary. Every style is temporary. Listen, I remember uh, earlier this year, I love a specific kind of sunglasses. I love sunglasses. If you know that about me, uh, I'm, I'm particular about them because um, they, they break easy and I'm pretty rough on them. So I need a pair, like I need I need some that, <laughs> that's got a warranty. You know, anybody need, and we got any more warranty people in here? Like I need them to replace it, no questions asked. Because if you start asking questions, I'm, you're, never gonna, <laughs> you're never gonna replace them for me, all right? So, um, so I remember earlier this year, I found online an insane deal. Insane deal. Because these glasses are pretty expensive. So I, I was captivated by saving some money. I was captivated by the deal. I really was. So I log online. I'm like, oh my gosh, sweetheart. I call her. I said, listen, I can buy like seven pairs of sunglasses for this deal for the same price that it would have cost one pair of sunglasses. Like I'm doing it. So I log online. I buy, I order all of these sunglasses. Uh, and then I'm, I'm totally overlooking every red flag thrown my way like every red flag. Like one, this particular company doesn't give deals like that. They, it doesn't happen. It's even company policy. But in my mind, I'm thinking, well, maybe they changed something. This is awesome. So like that doesn't, like all of a sudden that's going on and the website kind of seems to look legit, but it's not fully legit. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so maybe this is just a, a handler or another company uh, serving them. And so that was kind of weird. The biggest thing was when I finally got to like the point where I'm giving my address shipping things come in. It's coming from China. I know, I know. Couldn't understand the language, right? What they were even saying, like it was written in a complete different dialect. And in my mind, I'm thinking, mm, something, I don't know about that, but I'm going to give it a shot anyway. You know what I mean? <laughs> so push send, takes like three months to get them. They finally come in and when they arrive, they're in a box and thank God they're, they're in actual like cases, the hard cases. And I'm like, oh, maybe it's going to be okay. Pull them out, and you know, if you like sunglasses, you always got to do the test, right? Like if they're fully polarized, if they're actually what they say they're going to be, you do the sunlight test. So I looked, and I felt like in a moment, in an instant, that I was like a vampire seeing the sun for the first time. It was like, whew, my eyes. And there was, a, there was a split second that I thought, are they still in my head, you know? Like it was completely blinded. They were the cheapest the cheapest counterfeit sunglasses that I've ever placed on my face in my life. Within weeks, within weeks, they were all busted and broken, and I have lost all the money. But listen, I was so blinded by what it was promising that I did not even think to look at all of the red flags. And can I tell you that that's what happens in most of our lives? It happens all the time with us. Like we're given red flags all the time. Hey, don't be in, don't, you don't need to be in that relationship. That's going to go a bad direction. That's not going to end well. That's not, you know, that's not going to, like a bad decision. Red flag, red flag, red flag. But we are consumed by the promise. We're consumed by what it's giving. And we don't realize it's, it's temporary. It's not, it's not even going to last forever. Listen, here's a question you need to ask yourself. What decisions have you made in your life or are you making in your life that are proving to be temporary and full of regret? 
Instantly, I looked at the sun and I was instantly full of regret. <laughs> instantly. Like there's no questions asked, full of regret. This was the dumbest decision I've ever made. Just lost a bunch of money. Listen, stop living a life for the temporary pleasures of today. Start living. I love what it said about Moses. He was looking ahead to his great reward. Here's what I've learned about most of us. Most of us, we miss the incredible things that God's ultimately calling us to in this life because we can't get our eyes off of the here and now. We live our lives for what the scriptures tell us is a vapor. James says, our lives are but a vapor. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. Man, we're born one day, you know, if we're lucky, we live, into our, we live uh, maybe late into our 90s and, and life is over. And come on, how many of you, as the, 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 the older you've gotten, the faster things seem to fly? The older you've gotten, the faster the calendar seems to go through every single year. Why? Because life is fleeting. It's here today, gone tomorrow. And so many of us are living our lives day in, day out, working jobs as hard as we can work, as many hours as we can get to get as much money as we can get so that we can retire and live well in a vapor. And we don't look at our lives in, in the view of eternity. You see, Moses was able to escape the temporary fleeting pleasures of sin because he realized that he had to look at life through the lens of eternity, not the here and now. And if I'm ever going to realize, if I'm ever going to escape the temporary pleasures of this world, I've got to view it in, a, in, in, in light of eternity. Had I been able to look past all of the red flags that were popped up, literally all of the different red flags that were popping up, I would have saved 150 bucks. Like, it'd still be in my pocket. Wouldn't still be worried about all of it. Like, but I, it's easy. It's easy to buy in to the temporary fleeting pleasures of today if your eyes are not glued to eternity. You've got to look at every day of your life through the lens of something greater than the here and now. Number three, you need to know it's a trap. It's a trap. Genesis 4, 7, God's telling him, God's warning, uh, uh, more red flags. Come on. We've given, we've, in our lives, we've all been given more red flags and more opportunities to fall, to like, to not fall into the trap of sin than we would all give ourselves credit for. God himself is speaking uh, there, to this man. There's a story in Genesis 4, it's of Cain and Abel, and it talks about God trying to convince a brother not to do something that he knows is, uh, is, is wrong to do, that he knows that he's walking in that direction. And he goes to on to tell him, he says, you'll be accepted if you do what is right. But if you, fuse, if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door. I love this. Eager to control you. It's eager. It's hope. It's to deceive you. It's to trick you. It's temporary promises. And now he's got you. It's going to control you. But you must subdue it. There's a way out. There's a way out. You can subdue it and be its master. And you know this, sin is a robber crouching behind the door, eager to control you. Sin never intends on delivering its promise. Its entire hope is to control you and destroy you. The Bible says that be alert, be on guard. Your great enemy, 1 Peter 5, 8, your great enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. John 10, 10 says the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to what? Destroy. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Listen, sin is a trap. It's a trap. How do I begin to subdue it? How do I begin to even become a master over my own reality? How do I begin to visualize and see red flags? It begins by stopping, don't look at the temporary, look at the eternal, right? Right? Stop looking at the temporary. Stop giving in to the temporary fleeting pleasures of sin in this world and begin to look at life through eternity. You need to avoid it. Come on, you just need to avoid it. You need to stop surrounding yourself in circumstances. Stop placing yourself in compromising situations. Stop putting yourself in compromising circumstances. Listen, you're a teenager in this place. You're dating someone. Stop going on dates by yourself. 
Stop sitting in the room by yourself alone. Listen, Jesus himself, had he sat on a couch long enough by himself, would have done some things, would have messed up. He knew that he knew that he knew there's a stupid switch in every human being, and you don't place yourself in compromising circumstances and situations. Like, don't do it. Avoid it. Uh, run from it. If you are, sometimes you can't avoid being placed in a circumstance. I'm reminded of a story in the Old Testament, a man named Joseph. He didn't place himself there. He was put there, but when he realized realized it, what did he do? He ran from it. Over and over again in scripture, it teaches us, flee from sexual immorality. Flee from any form. Flee from any form or recognition of sin in your life. If there's, if it's present and you recognize it and you know the enemy's attempt is to tempt you into it, what should I do? Run from it. Walk away from it. And then stop. You don't listen. Here's what you need to know. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The old has gone the new has come. That's a promise of God. You don't have to stay in the situation that you're in. You can stop. There's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life that has given you everything you need in this moment to walk away from it. The reality is I've got to accept the, re the tools that the Lord has given me. There are people in my life that I need to that I that need to know about stuff in my life. There are things and there are stuff that God is placing, wisdom that He's given me that I can that I can use to walk away from sin in my life. So what does it look like for me to become me? For me to begin to walk in the newness of life that Jesus promises to bring. Come on, turn your notes over. I'll share these with you this morning. Number one is I've got to trust God's plan. I've got to trust His plan. Come on, that's easier said than done. Anybody been in a circumstance, in a situation where you've asked this question, God, why in the world is this going on? Why me? Why now? Why this? We've been there. I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, and he says this in chapter 55 of that book. It says, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. Come on. He didn't even say like a little bit. He said nothing. We're not even in the same universe of thought process as God. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. If I'm going to become me, if I'm going to begin to, uh, to live in the newness of life that Jesus and only Jesus can bring, I've got to learn to trust God's plan. I say this often in my own life, and I I have to remind myself of it all over and over again. When I can't trust his hand, when I don't understand what's going on, I've got to be able to trust his plan. When I can't see what's happening, God, I don't see your hand. I don't see what you're doing. I don't understand. Why is this going on? God, but I, I know this. I can trust your plan. I know you got a plan and it's good for me and it's, and it's, it's for a, a purpose and for, uh, for prosperity and not for harm. It's, it's for me. The Bible says God can cause all things to work together for the good of those that are called according to his purpose. How do I begin to trust his plan? Number one, you want to write this down. I need to recognize his bigness. I've got to understand that God is bigger than me and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with him being big. If I could figure God out, guess what he wouldn't be? God. Especially if Brandon Doss could figure God out, right? If I can figure him out, we're all in trouble. <laughs> Like, he's bigger than me. He's bigger than my thoughts. He's higher than anything I could fathom or, or, or relate to. With his voice, guys, he created everything. Check this out. He is everywhere, past present, and future. He operates outside of time and space. He created the world with his voice. Like he is bigger than anything we could think or imagine, yet he has a plan for us. We are literally but a speck of sand in the, in the, in the ocean of the universe, and, and he still designed and created a plan tailor-made for my life. He is bigger. And we have to understand that when I don't understand, I can trust his plan. God, I don't understand what's going on. I don't see what's happening, but I'm trusting that you're bringing me through it. I'm going to trust your word today. You need to ask God questions. You know God's not afraid of your questions? God's not afraid of you asking him a question as if we're going to one-up him on something. Like, hey, have you ever thought about this, God? <laughs> what about, 
Like he's not afraid of our questions. He's got it all figured out. He has a plan. Ask him questions. He'll give you answers. He'll be able to speak. The more I ask, the more he can speak. And then I need to seek the wisdom of others. That's how I begin to trust his plan. I need to seek the wisdom of people in my life. A lot of times God speaks through people in our sphere of influence. And if we would seek, the Bible says in Proverbs, victory is found in the counsel of many. Victory is found in the counsel of many. Seek the wisdom of other people. Number two, if you're taking notes, I need to live God's design. I've got to trust his plan. I've got to live his design. There is one thing universal that all of us were created for. Now, he's got a tailor-made plan for each and every one of us, but all of us, all of us, every one of us, it's a result of this happening in our lives. Matthew chapter six, he's talking to a bunch of people who are worried sick about everything that we all are worried about. Worried sick about how we're going to pay the bills, how we're going to how we're going to make another dollar, how we're going to get ahead, how we're going to like it's all of us. This it's all we worry about. So don't worry about these things. Saying what will we eat, what will we drink, what will we wear? The things these things dominate thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs, and this is it. This is our purpose. What's my purpose? Come on, this is it right here. This is profound. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and he will give you everything you need. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. He will give you everything you need. You know, there's never been a time when my kids have come to me. I've got two kids, Isabella's nine, Shepherd's three. There's never been a time that either one of them have come to me with a need that I was not overly willing to meet the need. Overly. With joy, I meet the need. That's our father. We worry so much about how we're going to do it, how we're going to get ahead, how we're going to accomplish the goal, how we're going to make it happen, how we're going to build the home, how we're going to get the relationship, how we're going to get the job, how we're going to overcome addiction, how am I going to do it? I, 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 me, 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 and God's saying the whole time, seek first the kingdom. Your purpose on this earth beyond any other thing is to seek him first. Here's what I've learned. Jesus plus nothing is everything. Jesus plus nothing else in this world is everything you'd ever need to accomplish God's purpose and plan for your life. Number three, obey God's command. I love this one. We get a command from Jesus in John chapter 13. It says, so now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. So you should love each other. And I love this. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Come on, isn't that awesome? You want to underline that. If you don't get anything else, I want you to get this today. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Notice it doesn't say that that your attendance at church every time the doors are open are going to prove to people that you know who Jesus is. Notice it doesn't say... It doesn't say that your memorization qualities and capabilities of all of Scripture are going to prove to the world how much you love Jesus and how, how good a disciple you are. It doesn't say how, like, how in tune you are with all things spiritual. No. It says your love for one another. You're never more like Jesus than when you're serving other people. We are never more recognizable by the world around us as Jesus followers than when we're meeting the needs of other people around. Never. That is the caveat. That's the thing. What's the thing that makes people a believer? Is it that they said a prayer when they were five years old? Is it that they were bad? No, 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 no. The thing that tells the world that we're disciples is that we love one another. It's an action verb. It's something I do. It's something I'm a part of. It's it's not something I go to. It's something I am. I serve people, not because I'm trying to earn anything. I serve people because it's who Jesus is and him living through me makes a difference in the world around me. How am I going to become me? Newness of Jesus. What does that look like? I obey his command, serve and love one another. God so loved the world that he gave, that he gave. What did he do? He served the world. That's what it means to look like Jesus. What does it mean to look like Jesus? I live my life in view of eternity for the cause of people around me. 
That makes the difference in the world. I want to pray with you. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? Our band's going to come. They're going to play some music. Listen, nothing funny or weird's going to happen. I want to put you at ease right where you are. I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. Maybe you would be honest with yourself and you're kind of taking an assessment of your life right where you're sitting. What's wrong with my style? Man, what's wrong with the life that I'm living? What's wrong with the decisions that I'm making? Could it be that you're being deceived? Man, could it be that you are so in love with the temporary fleeting promises that only sin gives but can't deliver? Could it be that you're stuck in a trap? Man, you're stuck in in an addiction that you can't seem to overcome. You've tried, you've tried, you've tried. You've said to yourself, I'll never go to that website again. I'll never click on that again. I'll never take that drink again. I'll never fill in the blank. You're stuck in a trap. You don't know what to do to get past it. I'll tell you, I got your answer. His name's Jesus. And it's called community. And it's called and it's called obeying his command. It's called living out a life on purpose, view, viewing, beginning to shift your perspective of the here and, from the here and now to the eternity. Maybe you're here today and you need a brand new relationship with Jesus. I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I'm gonna invite you to pull that connect card out. It says, I'm committing my life to Christ. Can I tell you, I promise you, I promise you, ask yourself this question. What has changed in my life? And if it hasn't, if there's not been, Can I tell you, Jesus will bring all the change you ever needed. Come on, you need a relationship with him today. I'm going to invite you into that. Mark that on your Connect card. We're going to send you some letters in the mail this week to give you some information, some steps forward in your faith journey. We want to walk walk with you hand in hand in figuring this thing out. So, Lord, I love you. I'm thankful for my friends today. Thank you for your grace. Oh, thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit that's touching our hearts right where we sit. And as you're touching people, communicating right now, Holy Spirit, God, I pray for those right now who are deciding, making a decision that they need a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you would forgive us of our sins, that you would do what only you you can do. Your word says that you will take our sin and throw it as far as the east is from the west, never to bring it up again. So Father, we accept your grace, your salvation. Thank you. And we commit to follow you as our savior, and as our Lord. God, we're going to live a life on purpose that honors you. We're going to walk in your command. We're going to begin to love people. We're going to begin to live, view life in in view of eternity, not the here and now. We're going to begin to make decisions in our lives as it relates to your call on our lives and your plan for our lives. And we're going to begin to see you step by step bring incremental change in our families and in our lives. God, we'll give you praise for it. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for a changing eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, people. Can we celebrate that today? Come on, people saying yes to Jesus.